All right, so in this video, we're gonna go through 10 things that you must do before starting your private practice. Before we dive in, if you haven't done so already, please go ahead and subscribe down below. Hit the thumbs up button on this video. Only if you want to though, there is no pressure. All right, let's just dive right into it. Now, the very first thing you're gonna need is malpractice insurance. Now, this is non-negotiable. You absolutely need it. It is really your only source of protection if things are to go wrong, if you're to get sued or anything like that. Now, some of you might already have it in place because of your current job or your former employer. But for me, I worked in a big hospital setting. I was never told to get malpractice insurance. I think I was covered under the hospital or I was just never educated properly on the topic. However, in private practice, you need to supply that for yourself. And in fact, many other steps, if you choose to do so, such as getting or getting paneled with insurance companies is going to require you to be insured. Now, there are tons of different malpractice insurers out there. My recommendation is to find the malpractice insurance that correlates with your profession. For example, for social workers, the NASW, which is the National Association of Social Workers, they actually have a company that provides malpractice insurance. I think it, I don't know if it's actually their company or they just kind of recommend it, but it used to be called NASW Assurance. And so this malpractice insurance was actually designed for clinical social workers in private practice. So I went with them. And they also have this, if you're a mental health counselor, you can go to the Mental Health Counseling Association and see what insurance they recommend. Psychologists, go to the psychology, the APA, see what insurance insurance they recommend. So it's always, I mean, I think this is a good idea because then that insurance is tailored specifically to your unique profession. The next thing you want is to have some sort of plan in place. Now, not just a plan in your head, but perhaps a plan that you've written out. Now, it doesn't have to be tremendously extensive, but we want some sort of roadmap and a guide for where we're headed in our private practice journey. Let me explain a little bit further. And so you kind of want to think about what is the point of going into private practice, right? Now, this might seem like an obvious question, but are you someone who wants to do it full time? Are you doing it part-time in conjunction with another job? Do you want to be an entrepreneur? You know, like what exactly are you doing in private practice? So that kind of creates this like broad vision for where you want to go. Now this can always change, right? But it will help inform the other decisions that you have to make. So for example, if you want to go full-time in private practice, you want to make sure that your private practice is set up in such a way that it can sustain you and provide a full income for you, right? Now, if you just do it haphazardly and just jump into private practice, but not really think through why you're going into private practice, Practice, you can run into some snags because you're not prepared or, you know, this kind of thing. So we always want to have some sort of vision for where we're headed. So what I encourage you to do is take a couple of minutes, maybe an hour of your time and sit down with a piece of paper on your computer, wherever you take notes and think about your big vision for your private practice, right? And you can ask questions like, why am I going into private practice? What do I want the private practice to look like in a year? You know, what's the point of starting a private practice? And then start to write that out. So once you have some sort of plan in place, it's a good idea to consult with an attorney. Now, an attorney is someone you want to set up a meeting with so that you can ensure that you're in compliance, right? So are you, so do you have the right licensure to do private practice? You know, what are the telehealth guidelines that you need to follow? What are the HIPAA policies you need to follow? Is there certain intake forms that you need to be a part of your package? Did you need to have certain policies in place to make sure that you're in compliance in your private practice? So there's all sorts of legal nuance that goes into starting a private practice. It really isn't too complicated, but I would always suggest reaching out to an attorney to have a one-time consultation. And you can really kind of say, hey, you know, I'm looking to start my private practice. What is it exactly that I need to be in compliance? And then from there, the attorney is going to be able to tell you, you know, exactly what you need set up. You know, they can guide you in some sort of direction in terms of whether or not you need a, an official business entity. Um, they'll kind of guide you in that regard. They'll make sure that by the time you see your first client, you know, your paperwork is in compliance, that you're actually following all the legal guidelines, your, um, your licensure guidelines, all that. So by the time you log in to have that first session or you're in person to see that first session, you know that you've already consulted with the attorney and have the peace of mind that everything you're doing is in compliance with the law and licensing boards. Oh yes, and you don't want this to just be any attorney Attorney, but you want this to be an attorney who's familiar with private practice. And there's a whole bunch of them out there. Another thing you're going to want to have done is picked out a practice management solution. Sometimes they're called EHRs, electronic health records, right? And this is going to be basically the platform you use to take notes, onboard clients, receive payments, sometimes chat with clients, 
do video conferencing, and there's all sorts of platforms out there. Oh yes, and before I forget, this is the perfect time to talk about the sponsor of today's video, Jane. Jane is an all-in-one practice management solution that makes it super simple to run your practice. And I mean every aspect of your practice. You can submit insurance claims directly through Jane. You can host video appointments if you're all virtual or if you're just doing any virtual work with clients. It's all HIPAA compliant, so everything is totally secure. There's a client portal, so you can upload documents for clients, like an intake packet for them to sign. You can send them other documents like homework and worksheets for them to easily download. They can also use the portal to schedule with you online. And the scheduling tool works in such a way that the clinician's time is prioritized. You can modify almost everything about the schedule. You can modify how much time is in between sessions. You can modify how long sessions are. That way when a client books with you online, it fits right into your calendar perfectly and it's updated in real time. And these are just a few of the features that I love about Jane. If you're interested in checking out Jane, use the link down below in the description and use code MATTHEWLCSW for a free month. I also think it's a good idea to consult with an accountant. Now, an accountant is someone who's gonna help you with your finances in your private practice. Now, when you consult with an accountant before starting a private practice, you're gonna to wanna to share with them your goals and vision for the practice. So for example, when you meet with the accountant, you're gonna tell them about what it is you're hoping to do, how much money you're hoping to make, and actually where you are starting. And then from there, they're gonna help you with a whole bunch of things. They can help you decide whether or not you need to set up a business entity, a professional limited liability company or an LLC, a PLLC, or something like a PC, a professional corporation. They'll be able to guide you and give you all the nuanced information about taxes and what it is that would best serve you and your goals. And then they're also gonna be able to help you with the very practical things like getting your accounting books set up, You know whether or not you need QuickBooks to keep track of your private practice finances. They'll be able to guide you on that. And then they'll actually be able to guide you in how you're actually supposed to pay taxes as someone in private practice because this is gonna change now that you're in private practice, right? If you're working for a corporation or another agency, most of the time your taxes are taken out for you and you get your paycheck, right? And then you file taxes at the end of the year. But in private practice, it's different. A lot of people have to pay taxes quarterly. They have to keep track of the taxes on their own because they're doing it themselves now. An accountant's gonna help you understand exactly how much tax you need to pay when you need to pay. All that stuff is most likely new if you've never been self-employed, right? So this is why having an accountant on board when you first start, even before seeing your first client, is gonna be helpful. Even more than that, if you are telehealth, then there's things that get all sorts of complicated. So for example, my business is established in New York. I live in New York, I'm licensed in New York. That is where the business is established. However, I am a telehealth provider and I'm also licensed in New Jersey. And I see clients who live in New Jersey and I'm licensed there, right? So my accountant, as he did some research into that, I also have to keep track of which clients I see in New Jersey, even though it's telehealth, and which clients are in New York because there's all sorts of different rules about how you pay tax and where the clients are sitting versus where you're sitting and how business is administered. I mean, it gets really confusing. I can't answer all those questions. It's just not my wheelhouse. So that's why I have an accountant help me with that nuanced stuff. I mean, how else was I supposed to know by myself as a therapist that if I see a client who sits in New York and a client who sits in New Jersey, the way I approach taxes at the end of the year is gonna be different. I might have an inkling, but I didn't really know what to do. So thankfully I had an accountant on board. He was able to help me with that. So having that kind of consultation before you start your private practice is gonna set you off on the right foot. And after those conversations with an accountant and a lawyer, you're also gonna have some sort of idea about whether or not you need to establish a business entity. Now, like I mentioned before, there's a couple of ways you can do this and it's gonna depend on the state in which you live in. A common business entity for a licensed professional is known as the PLLC or Professional Limited Liability Company. If you wanna know more about that, I made a video all about the PLLC in New York, which you can check out at the link down below. It'll go into more details. Um, but there's also something called the PC or Professional Corporation. At the end of the day, what a business entity is, is basically creating separation between you as a person and your business. And if you didn't know, your private practice, once you start one, this is a business. And so sometimes it's helpful to start a business entity Again, that creates separation between your 
private practice and you. So for example, if I have myself, right, Matthew Ryan as an individual, a person, and I start my private practice, let's say, well, I don't have to say I have a group practice. It's called progress therapy, right? I have a business entity established for that, right? So progress therapy is a business and then I own the business. And so now there's separation between me as a person and then that business, right? And so that business own bank account and EIN, that's an employer identification number or a tax ID number, right? And that's different than if I had just started a private practice but didn't start a business entity, it would just be me and my social security number and then the income would just go into a personal bank account. And as you can see, and as I even just talk about that, that sounds really muddy and really confusing. Some people do choose to do this and then they have to separate out business money from personal money and it gets all sorts of confusing. So it's usually a good idea to create some sort of separation, whether that be with a formal business entity or there's another option called a DBA. That means doing business as. And this is not necessarily a business entity, but basically what a DBA allows you to do is it allows you to create some separation between you and your business, not so much by establishing an entity, but by saying that you do business under a different name. Let's say I wanna establish a DBA. You can do this with your state. I'll actually leave a link down below to the New York State website where they talk about how to establish a DBA. And so once you establish that, you're basically saying that, yes, I'm Matt and I don't have a business, but I'm doing business under and you would make up the name that you want for your DBA. So let's say, for example, it's Progress Therapy. I have that DBA. And then you can actually get an EIN for that DBA. And then you can go ahead and open up a business bank account that way. Now, I don't know all the nuances of how that is specifically different than a PLLC or a PC. I do know it's different. It's not the same thing. But those are some of the options there. And you can do this as you go through private practice, right? So you can start as just a person using your own personal bank account and all of that. However, things do get confusing quite quickly. So my suggestion is always to figure out kind of the business entity situation first and then go from there. Cause it's usually easier to do it before you're seeing clients and all that. You have more time, a little more flexibility. And then once we go from there, it's always a good idea to open up a business bank account. Now, in order to do that, you need what's called an EIN. Like I said before, you either need to establish a business entity, the PLLC, the PC, or whatever it is that your state has for business entities, or you need to do the DBA, doing business as. Now I'm speaking from experience in New York State, so your state might be a little bit different, Again, this is why it's helpful to consult the accountant or the attorney, but what you do want is to open up a business bank account. So however you have to do that, it's usually gonna be a really good idea. And the reason for that is, let's say you start to see clients and you don't have a business bank account, that money is now gonna go into a personal bank account. And at the end of the year, at the end of the quarter, when you're paying taxes, you don't wanna to have to dig through a personal account and separate out the business money from the personal money. This just gets really muddy and confusing. Not a great idea, although people do do it. If you have your business account, then all your business payments flow right into that account at the end of the year, the quarter, whenever you're paying taxes. It's very simple to go through this account and to kind of organize it and to pay taxes properly. You're not weeding through you know, your personal finances. And to have your personal and business finances separated is always gonna be a really good idea. Not to mention with a business bank account, you can get a business credit card where you can purchase things for the business. I mean, these can be tax write-offs and things like that. So to have that separation is gonna be crucial. And I would always encourage people doing this before their first client if possible. Another thing you might wanna do before starting your private practice is to have practice policies in place. A good example of practice policies are gonna be things like a late cancellation policy, right? Or a no-show fee right? All the things that you want to establish. What are your working hours? When can clients contact you? Practice policies are going to be things that you adjust over time, especially as you get more experience in private practice. But you're definitely going to want to start with a firm set of policies that you have as a foundation before seeing your first client. And the big ones to think about right off the bat are going to be things like a no-show policy, right? So what happens if a client schedules but doesn't show up? Is there going to be a late cancellation fee or a charge? You know, how many hours in advance does that person need to cancel before there is a charge enacted? You know, what are your working hours? So when can clients call you or email you? How do clients call you and email you? What do you do if there's an emergency? You know, what is the workflow there? So you're going to want to think through these practice policies. That way you kind of have them as a foundation. And again, you'll, you'll adjust these and change these as time permits, as you get more experience, but at least starting with some sort of idea 
there. Now, again, this is going to be tied into consulting the attorney because they're also going to let you know what policies you need in place, what you're required to do as a private practitioner, and they're going to really help you hone in your practice policies, right? I remember consulting the attorney the first time. I said, how do I decide about late cancellation? And they were able to say, well, that's up to you. You know, you pick that. You know, how was I supposed to know that was up to me as opposed to some sort of law I had to follow? I was so new, I didn't really know. So to know what policies you're able to make yourself and what policies you might need to keep because of laws and regulations is also going to be helpful. And again, this is why we contact the attorney to find that out. But do have some sense of your practice policies before you see your first client. Similar to that, you're going to want to have a well-vetted intake packet. Now, when I say intake packet, I'm talking about all of the notes, forms, and things you require to send to a client before they see you in private practice. So some common things that you're all going to know about, the informed consent, the notice of privacy practices, you know, these kinds of things. Now you'll see a whole bunch of people selling you intake packets online. My advice is do not buy them from other therapists, buy them from an attorney who specializes in healthcare or private practice. I actually see attorneys who have good reputations selling intake packets far cheaper than people who are therapists. That's my biggest advice. You don't want to be playing games with the packets and you know the laws and all that. Don't make it up. Don't just use templates that you found on Google, but make sure that an attorney has seen your intake packet to, to make sure that it actually is legally sound. All right, definitely have that in place. And the next one, and this kind of relates to having the bigger goal and the bigger vision, have a sense of what you want your rate to be, right? And in addition to that, you know, do you have a sliding scale? What are your policies around that? So let's start with the rate. You know, the rate is how much you get paid per session and you are able to decide on, on that, right? So you get to decide how much your sessions cost. Right? So you do want to have thought about that before you see your first client. You don't want to have, just have some sort of guess. And when a client asks you, you know, how much is your rate? You're going to say, oh, you know, I, I don't, maybe this. You know, Sometimes we get overwhelmed. It's hard for us to think about that. It's a little bit different, especially if we're coming from an agency or some sort of setting. We're not used to talking about money and finances in that way. So definitely as part of your goals and part of your vision, think about how much the rate you're going to charge is per session. And so you can think about this from a few angles. Right, You can think about it from a personal income standpoint, right? So how much are you trying to make per year and how many clients are you trying to see in a given week, right? That just takes some simple math. Uh, are you someone who wants to kind of make therapy more accessible for your community? So do you want to, you know, reduce the rate? Uh, do you want a sliding scale? So you're going to have some sort of policy in place that if someone has, you know, X income, then your rate is this much, or if someone is in hardship, it's this much. I mean, you're able to think about all that and decide on it, um, but definitely have some sense of that before you see your first client. And not just a sense like, oh, I'm kind of thinking or guessing, but for that season of startup, you've said, okay, this is what I'm gonna charge. So set it in stone, and again, not permanently, but set it in stone at least for that first session, the first month or whatever it is, um, kind of ha and see how it works, and then adjust as needed. Anyway, these are the 10 things that I would really encourage you to get set up before seeing your very first client. If you get these things set up, you're gonna be way ahead of the curve. Anyway, I hope this video was helpful for you. I hope you learned something. At the very least, I hope it inspired you to thrive in private practice. If you found this helpful, you may wanna consider signing up for my consultation group. It's an online community where I interact directly with people. I answer all their questions either in thorough posts or in video format, webinars, that kind of thing. But I interact directly. People send me questions and I answer them all personally in a thorough way. You can sign up for that down below. There'll be a link in the description box. Other than that though, I look forward to seeing you soon.